had some um, mostly inner experience. I haven't seen any hardware yeah. flying around the skies. But I was also close friends with John Mack and, and uh, very much involved in his uh, research. And I consulted with him on his second book. Oh, I see. I didn't realize that. Anyways, he was uh, on Passport to the Cosmos, where he was uh, comparing UFO abduction stories or contact stories with um, the shamanic uh, accounts in Are you guys Africa filming? and Mexico and <coughs> things like that. And uh, um, so. Uh, and so he was, he was comparing uh, UFO stories with, with shamanic... Uh, yeah, he went and interviewed shamans in Mexico and South Africa, Credo Mutua, and, um, and people that had had mad mass sightings. And, um, and uh, we were... So, you know, and then, then I... I, um, I uh, I've also come to see the... The abduction scenarios is a small subset of much larger contact experiences. And then Michael Sala's book was very influential for me. Do you know his book? What was that Exopolitics. book? Exopolitics. Michael Sala. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been reading some of his stuff online. Yeah, he, yeah, he has a whole website. He's yeah. a website, and he's a newsletter, and he's a journal. And he's a, he's a social scientist, so I resonate that to approach. When I was teaching altered states of consciousness class, you know, it's a social science approach, to whether it's to near-death experiences or to... Um, psychedelic experiences mm -hmm. or um, shamanic experiences or paranormal experiences, mm -hmm. you, you don't prejudge the issue by saying it's impossible, right, right, <laughs> but right. you openly look at all the, the stories that people tell. So, right. And that was Mac's whole thing. And he was hauled up in the carpet by Harvard University, right. you know, uh, which I was too. And I wrote him a letter and saying, you know, I have some, I know what it feels like to be hauled on the carpet by Harvard University, so if you'd like me to uh -huh. write a letter of support which he didn't need, it turned out, but, um, you know, they were questioning his right to be doing that research, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but he made it clear that, um, it, he, tell, he tells this great story where he said, uh, the, the hammer chairperson of the psychiatry department said to him, you know, John, you would save yourself and Harvard University a great deal of trouble if you just said, you've discovered a new psychiatric syndrome, UFO abduction scenario syndrome. And he said, no, I can't do that, mm. you know, because that would be like complete violation of the trust that these people mm -hmm. put in me. Mm -hmm. uh, they, these people trusted me with very powerful and meaningful and traumatic, in some cases, experiences. And, uh, and my job, and I'm a psychiatrist, you know, so is to evaluate them right. and to check, the th uh, to check the theory. People say, oh, these people are nuts. So, and I'm a psychiatrist, and I can tell you these people are not nuts. Right. I interviewed them, I tested them, and they are completely healthy people right. who had very unusual experiences. So the correct scientific way of proceeding is to say, well, let's listen to what they're saying. Right. <laughs> you know? Well, Michael Salas also has a whole thing about how uh, maybe the U.S. government has had like secret contacts. Yes. And so well, on. that's that's the kind of consensus emerging out of you know numerous hundreds, hundreds of witnesses and. Uh, is that uh, two things. One is that there are extraterrestrial civilizations present in our world, and some go further and say they've been present for a long, long time. And um, the second is that the United States government and governments in, in other countries have for a long, long time, uh, ever since World War II, basically, uh, when UFO sightings increased, um, kept knowledge of UFO contacts and presence, uh, secret, uh, completely secret, and, um, uh, and that there have actually been landings. And Edgar Mitchell says this now. I've talked to him. You know, he's a, one of the astronauts. Mm -hmm. He's the founder of ions. What? He's the yeah, founder of yeah, ions. Right, right. And uh, there have been landings and uh, uh, crash landings. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they've uh, you know, re reverse engineered the technologies. And but Mitchell won't talk about anything strange on the moon. He doesn't. <laughs> no, he says he doesn't know about that, although it's hard to say with the astronauts. I think many people suspect that they were put on a, on a prohibition. Uh, one of the things Michael Sala does is he rates the credibility of various sources of evidence, and, uh, you which know, is the social science approach. So the most credible in the usual terms would be former military and government intelligence people from different countries who um, are basically coming out after 
you know, being feeling that released from a vow mm -hmm. of silence, and uh, they don't have an axe to grind, <laughs> other than to tell the truth of what they know, which they haven't been able to tell before. They're not New Age people at all. Right. They don't have fantasies. No, I've read a bunch of the aliens. accounts in the Disclosure Project. Yeah, the Disclosure so Project. Yeah. You know, so, so there's the cover-up, and then there's the Disclosure Movement. So within the cover-up, that may be increasing, and you know, then there's people like Philip Kraft, you know, that L.A. Times John was. Have you read his book, Challenge of Contact? And no, no, I've got to check that out. Yeah, there's another one. Literature is vast. It's unbelievable yeah. vast. But well, there's this. this um, seems to be the suggestion that there was this kind of this like cancer of secrecy has developed around a yeah. lot of these types of issues, and maybe even about free energy or anti-gravity right. technologies. Part of it, you know, yeah. because they're, uh, it's obvious that they're using us. They're not using carbon fossil, you know, right. energy, and they're not using nuclear energy. These crafts are uniformly described as being completely silent. And they obviously have a technology that's far superior than and what we, anything we have, because we're not anywhere. They're here. If they're here, see, this is like what I say, that if you can accept that as a fact, once you see that as a fact, that they're here, and they're visiting us, you ex it's a tremendous consciousness expanding, because you know they're more advanced civilization, because we're not going anywhere. We've got basically barely gone to the moon. Right. And, uh, and so... People feel very strongly that the energy technology that they have could potentially solve all of our energy problems virtually overnight, making oil and nuclear energy industry obsolete. Well, not overnight, literally, but mm -hmm. you know. pretty much. So <laughs> pretty much literally. So why is that? You know, why is that? Why is that being kept secret, or, or only being applied to military technologies? Mm -hmm. So yes, I heard my friend Mark. My friend Mark is also working on a project, and he said mm -hmm. that he was talking to you about the sense of. Um, kind of where you think the psychedelic kind of renaissance is taking mm. us or where it's mm. at right now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sort of how it's shifted from the 60s and where it might go in the future. Mm. So I was very mm -hmm. curious about that. Well, you know, I, I'm very close to Hoffman. And I, I agree completely what, with what he said last year, you know, because now, okay, so, and, and what he said all along, yes, of course, these are tools, you know, that should be used in psychiatry and psychology and psychotherapy. Um, um, Potentially, some of them, especially not LSD necessarily, but some of the other ones, are to powerful aids to psychotherapy. And that's happening again after a 40-year hiatus. And, um, but right from the beginning, uh, it was clear to Hoffman and, and others and Tim Leary that uh, it was, um, it was much, the psychedelics, the potential was much more than just psychotherapy. Not that that's bad, but you know, it's mm -hmm. good, but it's much more. For example, the enhancement of creativity and the induction of religious and spiritual experience. So, for, so what is that? I mean, that's incredibly profound and significant. And it's, you know, I discovered this, just recently discovered a copy of a letter that Hoffman had written to Tim Leary in the 60s, early 60s. And Hoffman was not, see Huxley and Wasson and, uh, and many others, and, and many psychiatrists and psycho uh, doc medical doctors, uh, to this day believe it should not be popularized, it should not be made available to non-medical people. It should be just medical researchers, that's it. Mm -hmm. Huxley felt, you know, it's basically an elitist stand, stance. And, and Tim Leary being an American and being Irish and being, you know, he, he never resonated to that. And it's interesting that Hoffman wrote in his letter, and I didn't know this until I just recently saw the letter, that you know, he, he said early on is the research should not be just, just pharmacology and psychiatry, but it should explore, he, he liked the idea of consciousness expansion. He should explore the implications of consciousness expansion. What does that mean for society and for culture? So that's the concept that I've pursued, so the expansion of consciousness and the expansion of a world view. You know, we're going through a period where we've got to, we've got to drop this scientific materialistic world view. It's mm -hmm. like killing us, basically. And all the technology that comes from it, uh, a non-recognition of the multidimensional nature of life and of the spiritual essence inherent in mm -hmm. every human being and every form of life. But do, uh, so. but do you see, like, so the 60s, there was this huge upsurge and then this kind of repressive containment. Yeah, the empire strikes back. Right? And now where do you see it going it, now So it went future? underground, yeah. see, but it was an underground culture. That's why, I mean, in, the, in my book, I would call it Birth of a Culture, but I actually think, you know, I'm a, 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 birth is a mammalian metaphor, and I think 
the mycelium is actually the perfect metaphor for a culture. It is called a culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a web of interconnectedness, like a network of interconnectedness, invisible, under the, under the ground, spreads globally, you know, spread, mycelia spread for tens of thousands of square miles. <laughs> Unbelievable. And so it's egalitarian, it's not hierarchical. So uh, people that are interested in psychedelics, like this conference is an example, can go all over the world and meet one another, encounter one another, understand one another instantly, just looking into each other's eyes. There's a drug war going on. This is insane. Mm -hmm. That has to change. I think the culture cannot thrive until uh, some other way is found to, um, to dissolve this prohibition. And prohibition was dissolved before. You know, alcohol prohibition was dissolved in the Depression. It might take a depression. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 30s, when, when um, you know, the country was in the dumps, then 1935, that's when they abolished prohibition, alcohol prohibition. They said, they finally think, well, why should Al Capone and his gangsters get all the money from liquor mm. distribution? And it's not a war on drugs anyway, it's a war on people. It's a racist thing. Mm. It's a racist and a class thing. Let's put all these black people mm. that are taking drugs, let's put them in jail and throw away the key. Who cares, mm. you know? That's the way the system works. And then we, but then every now and then they get one of the middle and class whites. Uh, white one process. of the things I had never understood, I still not, the war on drugs, I never understood it until the war on terror came along. The war on drugs, I said, it doesn't make sense to scare the, the, the kids, you know, about taking drugs. They're not scared. They don't believe it. And they know it's lies anyway. They have their own information. Mm -hmm. They're not scared. Or they're willing to take the risk. But then I realized it's not really addressed to them. The, the scare stuff about drug taking is addressed to the non-drug taking older generation of people who vote. That's who it's addressed to. And uh, watch out, you know, we've got to have laws to control, you know, because otherwise our kids... Uh, mm. They don't care, actually care whether you blow your brains out and you know, scramble them like the scrambled egg and stuff like that, or have to go to jail. That's no, of no interest. In, in fact, it's, it's beneficial, but they want to have the control system, and so they control the money, they get the money, mm -hmm. And the war on terror is the same way. It's just to induce fear in the population so they can put in prohibitions. Yeah, well, I mean, I, terror is an abstraction. Mm -hmm. And so are drugs. You can't put a war on, on drugs. Mm -hmm. They're just drugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they could be, re of course, they should be regulated. Mm -hmm. We regulate alcohol and tobacco. Why but you, you don't think that psychedelics were perceived as a social threat and demonized in the 60s because by they were some, particularly yeah, perceived? By some, you know, by, 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 by the elite people. They did weren't perceived as a threat by anybody who actually knew it. Hmm. The threat was the uh, you know people speaking and, and, and encouraging. Wasn't Larry called the most dangerous man in America? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And you know, yeah, Nixon called him that. And you know what he said in response? What? He says it's true. I have America surrounded. <laughs> that's the title of the biography that John Higgs wrote. <laughs> it's true. I have America surrounded. What do you think? Do you think that psychedelics, Jeremy? Do you think psychedelics were perceived as a, like a social threat in the '60s, or there's any reason why they would be perceived that way? Well, you know, I was uh, I was born in '59, so um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. a, a post facto mm -hmm. commentator here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty obvious, right? Uh, I think that uh, the idea that Leary was going to put LSD in the water system. I, I remember being about seven or eight in Montreal at the time, and that was in the newspapers. It was a complete fantasy. A complete fantasy. But it was in the newspapers, and people were worried yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, it's like a fantasy on the <laughs> par of, you know, that uh, these Saudi Arabian guys with box cutters hijacked an airliner. Is this a similar kind of fantasy? <laughs> <laughs> so what, so what except, except they actually <laughs> did it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, some, some Saudi Arabians were on the airliners with box cutters. That's not what brought the trade towers down. Hmm. And lo lots of them are alive. You know, you've heard about the Saudi Arabians that said, wait a minute, I, I didn't participate there. I'm actually alive, thanks very much. <laughs> mm, well, I guess it depends where. Yeah. It depends where. I mean, if you... Uh, I live in Switzerland, uh, and I'm a Canadian citizen, so that's a pretty privileged mm. um, position. Mm. Um, and I live like five kilometers from the French frontier, so I've got like a balcony seat on France. Now France is a, it's a closed place, mm. and it, it's, you know, they, they want to, mm. Mr. Sarkozy wants to send joint smokers <laughs> to re-education camp. Yes. 
you know, and soldiers to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Yes. And maybe nuclear bomb Iran. Mm. So it, it kind of depends where. And the people, it's been moving backwards. You know, even mm. in Switzerland, mm. it's been moving backwards. Mm. Uh, we got pretty close to uh, uh, making marijuana legal, and mm. then the, there's kind of a right wing. Mm. So it's the, the, it sort mm. of comes and it goes. goes. Back and forth. It, it depends if you're talking about what people are actually doing, and, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. versus the national legislation. It's, it's well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I've seen like. Um, you know, like ayahuasca now, a lot more people know about it, you know, from probably like your books, my, your books, my mm -hmm. books, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, and, and um, I don't know, it, it seems like there's less, the, the tone in the media is less <laughs> ridicule oriented around psychedelics. It, it used to be like a, immediately dismissed, like the New York Times would have to say on any article about psychedelics would be in like toys of the hippie generation. Hey, well, the, in the States, yeah. in the States. We, we, three, so we wrote the three ayahuasca books, right? Yeah, my mind had ayahuasca was one subject, but uh, one part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, well, there's been others. There's oh, been Benny others. Shannon. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, well, in, in in Germany and not, uh, you know, that's been true. Collected, yeah. uh, ed edited volumes. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the there is an increase. For example, like shamans. I, I, if you ask your average taxi driver in some place, you know whether the, she thinks that shamans actually have knowledge about plants. I think most people, citizens of the world, think, yeah, you know, there, there is no longer this, this uh, uh, ridicule associated with, with witch doctors. And I think that Western culture has opened up to, um, to considering the possibility that there might be something there. And, and right. ayahuasca in particular, I don't think anybody argues that ayahuasca is just um, crazy, dangerous stuff, because they're just so, the people who try it, uh, have these life-changing experiences. Mm -hmm. They're yeah, just lend uh, itself to being a street dog. I mean, um, I, I loved the uh, stuff in Shamans Through Time, mm -hmm. where you took these biologists down through mm -hmm. ayahuasca uh, experiences, and, and then you felt there was some correlation in terms of your thesis that they were actually able to access information that was actually useful, like sort of new information or, or different mm -hmm. information. Um, how, how has that kind of evolved? Well, the, um, if one were in an ideal world and one wanted to test my hypothesis, and of course we're not in an ideal world and we're not yeah. seeking to test my hypothesis, but if we were... State, state the hypothesis again. just so Okay, just that there it. is biomolecular information available in visions orchestrated by ayahuasca shamans. So you would take a hundred open-minded molecular biologists working on a given protein or whatever their particular concern might be um, and get them into the ayahuasca realm and to work on the problem for which they don't have a scientific solution for the moment to see if they can advance, get new ideas, new angles or new information. That would be testing the hypothesis. What's difficult about it is that when you take your, your average molecular biologist, these people tend to work in, in labs and they're, they're very focused in the objective knowledge approach. They have a hard time. They get very discombobulated when you put them in the ay ayahuasca realm. The, the first time I took three molecular biologists to do that, they, they spent most of their time uh, working on themselves, seeing their limits, and you know what? But they did get some insight. Into they, 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 but it, isn't that it, a necessary it, part of the process? But like it I changed their lives. These yeah. people came right. back. They got divorced. They right. had children. Yeah. They they left yeah. their jobs. Right. You know, right, and, and, right. and I think that but that's so indicative uh, in, in so many levels. Uh. Well, if you want to be an objective scientist, you have to spend a lot of time jettisoning your your subjective self, and then when you go into the ayahuasca realm, you see you have to deal with all the stuff you haven't been dealing with because you've yeah. been busy being objective. Oh. Do you still believe in objective science? I mean, do you believe in objectivity? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it has its uh, um, uh, uses, but it also has its, its limits. And the objective approach to subjective experience, you see? There's an objective approach to subjective experience. That is, you treat it with respect, you treat it as a source of data, and then you evaluate the data, you compare the data, you have different people Intersubjectivity, or different people could compare. Yeah, I would, say it would be more, I would say it'd be more of an intersubjective approach. Would be more accurate than well, an objective approach. Well, but well. if you look at the um, uh, desire of objectivity, it's a fairly uh, constructive one. It is to say, let us establish knowledge about the world around us that is not tainted by our own personal foibles. 
you know, let us be able to, 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 to agree on the world around us um, uh, in a way that uh, we don't have our, our subjective selves getting in there and yeah, making us disagree. That, and that Is kind that, of agreement can be made about the subjective experience but, as but, well. But yeah. I mean, like, like somebody like Rudolf Steiner or Gurdjieff would say that you're, you're only the type of knowledge even on a scientific level that you can access is dependent upon your level of being. You know, so like these molecular yeah. biologists were living at a certain level, they had this objective model of science, but in their subjective realm, they hadn't paid attention. So the ayahuasca said, you gotta pay attention to what you haven't done with your life. You know, but that might actually also change their whole approach to knowledge, ultimately, right? And they might access a different kind of scientific knowledge when they came back into the scientific realm. Yeah, right? I don't see it that way. I see that they, they did have <laughs> specific qu questions within their framework of knowledge, and they did get some specific answers to that. But they got a lot more besides, uh -huh. because it's a holistic experience, you know? The ex our experience on, on our lives are not actually separated into these categories mm -hmm. where you have molecular, and it's all mm -hmm. present in mm -hmm. every moment of our lives. So, and these experiences, you know, I think, your, your theory is fantastic for that, for explaining that kind of uh, effect of ayahuasca and other psychedelics where seemingly miraculous healings and insights can occur at the level of molecular and cellular level. What it doesn't really explain as well, you know, within that framework is how somebody can take ayahuasca and have, have a connection with their deceased ancestors. That's not a molecular level kind of Phenomenon. Or they're alien space brothers. Yeah, or they're alien <laughs> space brothers, exactly. You know? mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and that's, the, that, that's where uh, psychedelics have the potential for expanding the, the scientific approach. We can have a science of consciousness. And uh, the, the essence of the scientific method is replicability, verifiability, testing. Uh, and, it's, and so it's common knowledge that can communicate it clearly and can be shared and identified. And say, uh, somebody else can say, I often say that the difference between subjective and objective is plus one. Here's like, if I have an experience, I see some weird thing. Uh, I could be deranged, I could be uh, insane. But if I'm able to communicate the experience to one other person, it changes the ontological status of it. Because then we're looking at something, yes, I see that too. And then we expand that, you have a group of subjects, 10 subjects, 100 subjects, you know, like Rupert Sheldick is but doing. What if the, those 100 or 10,000 subjects are all experiencing the same paranoid delusion? Yeah, well, <laughs> what if? What if? That's, that, but that's one of the tests, you see. Like Rupert Sheldick is doing these experiments on animal telepathy. So he's, he's putting out in the newspapers and on television asking dog owners and cat owners to phone in mm -hmm. and, you know, set, set up a little controlled experimentation, and of course the scientists can say, well, it's just anecdotes and anecdotes. And he said, well, at what point does it cease to be an anecdote? 700,000 yeah, anecdotes. How about 2,000? Like statistically what, you know? significant. Yeah, way <laughs> over, you know, <laughs> the usual requirements. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful democratization. Mm -hmm. And the basic principle is the same, see? Uh, divination is really the same thing as experimentation because it's an experimentation is setting up a controlled set of variables, controlling the various sources of variations as much as you can in order to ask questions from nature and obtain information from the natural world. And when the, you know, the, whether, whether you do the instrumentation, the, I mean, we look at the molecular level through our micro, electron microscopes, the ayahuasca people found out that you can retune your brain to that level of course you would be able to do in your brain. Well, this cells and molecules is in the brain as well as elsewhere. You know? so, um, uh, and then, of course, the language it has to be translated. And so they use a different language. They talk about viruses and cells and all that kind of thing. They, 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 uh, the, they talk about snakes and little people. Like do you that. think there's been a danger of going in the other direction and beginning to almost like heroize the shaman and the shamanic cultures? Yeah, because in, in these cultures, they're kind of yeah. like um, sometimes very ambiguous figures and they can mess people up and shoot poison darts. Yeah. It's like almost like we've isolated yeah, the more medicinal and, and positive visionary aspects and have kind of ignored or like sloughed to the side the shadow aspects, yeah. you know? Yeah, in psychiatry and psychology, it's, you know, the the general understanding has changed. Back in the 60s and 70s, when this literature on shamanism first became available, you know, people were writing articles on shamans and schizophrenia and saying, oh, they're schizophrenic, but they, you know, they live in a 
culture, blah, 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 it's you know, a cultural thing. People don't say that anymore. Now it's almost the other way around. Uh, doctors, and psychiatrists especially, like to identify with being a shaman and like that because it's like magical power, you know, mm -hmm. more powers than usual. But um, like what? Michael Horner says, you know, you, you don't decide to be a shaman. You, you get called to be a shaman by the spirits call you. So. Which is what Hoffman said, you see. The mm -hmm. Spirits, he said, he said that. The spirit of LSD called me. He didn't use the term spirit, but he said LSD found me. You know, I well, stumbled upon it. had sort of dreams of the molecule and so on. No, no, he, he, he was, it was an accident. Yeah. It was actually a lab. He was a, sl a sloppy lab technician, <laughs> which is like inconceivable for a Swiss <laughs> pharmaceutical <laughs> chemist, you know, to have a sloppy <laughs> lab. You accidentally absorbed some chemical. I've had chemistry. No, but didn't, impossible. He, but didn't he originally have dreams of the molecular structure of uh, no, 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 no. He was no, working on ergot. He was working on ergot. He, he connected it to a childhood vision. Mm. He'd have a cosmic vision as a childhood, nine-year-old of being, you know, encompassed in the all-embracing natural world. Mm. And at that moment, that was his life's vision. He said, oh, "I'll never be able to communicate this in painting or working. I think I'll become a chemist. You know, study the material world because it was in the material world it was in nature." And when he was working on ergot, he was working on ergot, he knew nothing. He didn't know about the work on mescaline that had been done. He had no idea that there was a drug that affected consciousness, that that was possible. And his first LSD experience, he, he said, this is the same place. I asked him, mm. how did you know? Because he didn't know about mescaline. He was, he was a very conservative, you know, ergot pharmaceutical making medicines. Mm. And how did... And, uh, he said, this is the same place, so it must be a natural substance, like ergot, <laughs> that I'm working on, because it was all about nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeremy, so, Jeremy, what do you think about, like, uh, I was talking about with him, about how do you see, like, the future of psychedelics uh, from where we are now, like, 20 years down the line? I mean, do you have, like, a, I mean, do you have a vision for how it might go? Or? Um, yeah, I I'd spend as little time as possible speculating because I'm just so busy trying to interpret the present and also understand the past. I think that um, many things are possible uh, in this world and in particular about the, the future of uh, psychedelics. Uh, you know, I, I don't really have too much to say uh, about it. And it seems pretty obvious that if humanity is going to be around in 20 years that there's still going to there will be some humans taking psychedelics which ones and how it's going to be is um, hard to say. I don't know. How, what, what, what does your crystal ball show? Um, well, I'm, not, I'm trying to think about it because I'm supposed to give a talk on the subject today. So I'm <laughs> trying, to <laughs> to scam, trying to scam off other people's ideas. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, personally, I, I, I like to be speculative. You know, I, I'm mm -hmm. interested. Like, I mean, I've had, um, you know, sort of psychic experiences in relationship to psychedelics and. and you know, paranormal type experiences. And uh, so I have to accept that as data, you know, of my own sure, exactly. logical exactly. existence. So that points to, to for me towards, you know, the, this possibility that there is this other form of almost like energy, which would be a kind of psychic energy that might be, you know, if we became more consciously uh, attuned to it, uh, might become more available to humanity in the same way like electricity was once you know unknown and unavailable people had seen lightning but they didn't know that you could like make a power grid or transform the whole planet so then we were able to make this you know century and a half transformation of the whole physical environment of the planet yeah. you know so what if the fact that more and more people are kind of you know through psychedelics and other types of experiences tuning into psychic energy and, and its different manifestations what if that points towards some you know, f future science, where we're actually able to utilize that force as, as, as something transformative. Yeah, absolutely, that's already happening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he looks a little bit more skeptical. <laughs> well, th so a little bit, of, you don't need to just speculate about the future. What you're describing is sort of visionary anticipation. That's a vision. A vision is a vision of a perception of a future probability, mm -hmm. or possibility or probability. It's not like people often think that it's going to prediction. It's not a prediction, you see. And when uh, that's the tradition of divination. Divination can be into the past or into the future. And uh, with the one difference being that the past, you know, it actually happened the way it happened, where the future didn't happen. So it's probabilities. And people think about probabilities all the time. And the shamans uh, do their work, shamanic work, whether through drumming or, or substances, to also look at the future equally as the past. 
Well, and, uh, and it seems and, if you can... Older people, like a vision right. for your life. You, right. know, you go on a vision quest, what's the vision for your life? It's not a prediction, right. but it's an inspiration. Like, uh, you know, maybe I'll make it. I mean, uh, a child who has right. a vision, I'm going to be a doctor, like that. Right. We have a vision, Martin Luther King's dream of equality. That was a vision, you see. It wasn't a nighttime dream of something. It was a vision of equality that he wants to move towards. And it, and it seems like maybe if you can articulate it properly, you can like get more people on board or something. You can yes. begin to make it a little bit more. You can increase the probability in, so, in yes, some sense. Yeah, something. if you can articulate <laughs> you know, the, the aspirations of... Uh, what are the uh, a vision of peaceful uh, being together? You know, the, the, the capitalist industrial corporations, they have their vision of a globalized world, an integrated market where they can, you know, sell their products all over well, the world. That's their vision. Yeah, but actually that vision... We don't have to go along I mean, with if that. You, if you look at like the sort of analysis <coughs> of capitalism, that vision actually falls apart because you always need to have new markets to yeah, penetrate. Yeah, exactly. And actually, like, yes, the analysis is that... What happens you when you get out of the planet? When, yes. you, when you've globalized the whole planet, then you have to do like the shock doctrine that Naomi Klein talks about, where yeah. you kind of, you know, almost intentionally destroy and recolonize aspects within empire, because that's all you got left exactly. to do. You know. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And not to mention you're depleting the resources base. You know, well, we don't count that, you know. <laughs> all the forests are gone, oh geez, we'll have to find something <laughs> else to cut down. <laughs> but what, you know, so one, one thing I've discussed with a few <clears throat> people here, I mean, I guess it remains in the realm of, uh, you know, I mean, ha speculative thought in a way, is how would you begin to, um, you know, find a kind of a scientific articulation or hypothesis around this kind of psychic realm or psychi psychic phenomena? You know, or do you even need to? Yeah, yeah well, I, I talked about that this morning. You know, it's a, the psychology, need, and Groff talks about it too, it's, it needs to expand to, uh, we're multidimensional beings. That's the big thing, that's the big but, thing but that science has to do. And of course, psychology, we're multidimensional beings. We're not just unidimensional Right, but even that is in sort bodies. of a, a language that is kind of, um, I mean, it's, I, it's helpful on one level, but on another level, it's, it's, it's not Well, very that's just a start. Particular that's specific. just a start. You know, yeah. That's just a, an attitude. <laughs> then you have to explore those levels, and you develop a language for exploring. The yogis have done that. For, you know, the Buddhists have done it. The Hindus did it. You know, for, uh, and esoteric sciences like theosophy and others did it. And it's possible to you know, develop a language. Yeah. And, 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 and the, the yogis would do their controlled thing. Mm -hmm. They laid out their practices. Well, you do this practice for, you know, X number, and then at a certain point, mm -hmm. you, you, you start exploring this other realm, and mm -hmm. then you look for those kind of signs. And, and uh, you know, they have their different technologies for exploring the inner dimension. But we would still need to know the physical mechanism, I think, to be satisfied. <laughs> well. I, I was just curious, um, the tuberculosis work, um, I mean, do you think that it's this kind of scenario where if you could determine, you know, that the ayahuasca had a positive effect and on tuberculosis, could it be utilized as a medical treatment? Well, actually, it's not uh, ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. It is an ayahuasquero who has identified a plant called boa okay. so it's uh, the, which means liana of the boa. So it's a, it is a jungle liana, but it's mm -hmm. not Banisteriopsis okay. capi. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, known to Shipibo people as uh, a having wound healing properties. Mm -hmm. And this shaman had a vision when he w had a tuberculosis patient that, that uh, liana could be applied to tuberculosis. And when I presented the uh, tuberculosis researcher to the shaman, he brought out his tuberculosis plant, and it is now being tested in the lab in Chicago with preliminary positive results. And the so it's I not a psychoactive. Plant. It's not at all psychoactive, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I see. but it is. You don't uh, add the tryptamine. No. So no. What, what were you going to say about it? Well, so it's it's just a very basic. Uh, it's like the smallest common denominator, bringing together a, a scientist and a shaman, looking for a cure for a disease for which science doesn't have a solution currently, to try to find a solution. Mm -hmm. And um, you know whether the scientist took ayahuasca or whether the shaman took ayahuasca is almost irrelevant. It's what what counts is finding a solution. And if we mm -hmm. find a solution, then we can continue the research. So it's like getting a foot in the door.